Welcome, my name is Holly. I'm a program manager at Edison Ford Winter Estates. And this month's topic is Mary McLeod Bethune, her life and legacy. And I'm joining the young ladies on the steps of Bethune Cookman College around in the 1940s. I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute. But let's um, share our screen and get started. There's Mary McLeod Bethune there. And let's do the slideshow from the beginning. Mary McLeod Bethune was born on July 10th, 1875 near Maysville, South Carolina. We'll get to the Florida connection soon. She was the 15th of Samuel and Patsy McLeod's 17 children. Her parents and older siblings had been enslaved during the Civil War. This is their cabin here. She was the first one that was not born into slavery. After the Civil War, her mother worked for her former owner until she could buy the land the family grew cotton on. When she was young, Mary would accompany her mother to the homes of the white people where they would deliver laundry. One time as a young child, Mary picked up a book, but when she opened it, a white child took it away from her saying Mary didn't know how to read. And I've read a couple different versions of this story. Others was um, that she was doing work for the, um, her former owner um, when her daughter went with her and that's where this incident happened. But Mary definitely recalls this happening and being an impetus for her. Mary decided that the only difference between white people and black people was the ability to read and write. So she set out to get an education as a very young child. Mary spent her childhood balancing school and work in the cotton fields. When she was nine, she was picking 250 pounds of cotton a day. She had to walk five miles to and from school. Being the only one of her siblings to attend school, she taught her brothers and sisters each day what she had learned. Inspired by the work of her teacher, Mary hoped to study at Scotia Seminary and to eventually become a missionary in Africa. And there's Mary as a young woman. Mary was focused and an excellent student and Miss Wilson went out of her way, that was her teacher, to secure a scholarship for Mary to be able to attend Scotia, which she graduated from in 1894. After graduation, her mentor sent her the money to attend Moody Bible Institute, which still exists today, where she planned on training to become a missionary abroad. She was the only African-American woman attending there. Unfortunately, her dream of becoming a missionary in Africa was prevented when she was told that black missionaries were not being sent to Africa at the time. She focused her energy on becoming a home missionary, someone who served in the US as a teacher or a missionary. She remained in Chicago for a year visiting prisoners in jail and working at the Pacific Garden Mission where she served lunches to the homeless and help people living in the poorer areas of the city. She then decided to become a teacher and return to Maysville, her hometown. She taught at the mission school where she had first learned to read and later moved to Augusta, Georgia to teach at Haynes Normal and Industrial Institute founded by Lucy Craft Laney, who was determined to bring education to young back women. At the time that was considered um, a, a rarity unfortunately. Though only there a year, it had a great impact on Mary. I believe the greatest hope for the development of my race lies in training our woman thoroughly and practically. And there she is with a class of her students. After leaving Georgia, she returned to South Carolina, where she taught at Kendall Institute. There she met and married fellow teacher Albertus Bethune, and they had one child, a son, in 1899. They left South Carolina and moved to Palatka, Florida, 
and later to Daytona Beach, where she will remain in 1904, where she began her own school. Her one-room school was known as the Daytona Normal and Industrial School for Negro Girls and taught reading, writing, and home economics. And as I said, there's one of her classes. There's lots of pictures of her on Florida Memory Project um, and lots of um, information if you um, are interested in reading more. In less than two years, the school expanded to 250 students, many who lived in the school's dorms. And it does, I didn't put this in here, I guess, but she started with only five students and her son, and her son, and that was it. Pretty much nothing. And can you imagine that this is Daytona? It looks so different today. Um, I hope as we go along, you'll find out what an amazing woman she is. That's my goal to present to you her story. And I wish more people knew who she was. And this is one of her classes. Um, in later years, when the college had expanded, the school had expanded. Albertus left Mary in 1907. They would officially stay married until his death in 1918. Mary had raised their son and managed her school alone. She worked endlessly to keep the school running. And many of the school's supplies were donated. Obviously, they did not have a lot of money. Mary had so little money that she wore secondhand clothing mended by her students in sewing class. Her efforts attracted the attention of both white and black philanthropists who vacationed in Florida. And that part was taken from life story, Mary McLeod Bethune, 1875 to 1955. The school board eventually had many of the school's board eventually had many of the nation's most famous business people as members, including John D. Rockefeller. And in later years, black millionaire and business person, person uh, um, fascinating, um, strong woman in her own right, Madam C.J. Walker was a donor. The school adapted to the changing needs of the community. Mary Ann added a high school and vocational programs. And in 1911, she observed that none of the local hospitals served black patients. So she added a nursing program so the school could open its own hospital. In 1923, Bethune brought about the merger of her school with the Cookman Institute in Jacksonville, Florida. Together, they created the co-educational Bethune-Cookman College. In 1931, the school was accredited by the Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools of the Southern States, with its name changed to Bethune Cookman College. Bethune became the first African American woman to serve as a college president. At the time, it was one of the few colleges below the Mason Dixon line where African Americans could receive something beyond a high school diploma. Today, it is an accredited university with over 4,000 students. Um, I just read a little bit more, maybe closer to 3,700 and 3,800. In addition, to, but it still remains. In addition to the college, Bethune worked with the Florida Federation of Colored Women's Clubs to develop a home for delinquent black girls in Ocala, Florida. She served as the president of the Southeastern Federation of Colored Women's Clubs from 1920 to 1925, the National Association of Teachers in Colored Schools, 1923 to 1924. And she also served as the president of the National Association of Colored Women, 1924 to 1928. In 1935, she founded the National Council of Negro Women while serving as the president of Bethune Cookman College. This woman was unbelievable in a number of areas she was active in and all she did while having a full-time job as a college president and raising her son.
Mary was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt and became the highest ranking black woman in government when President Franklin Roosevelt named her Director of Negro Affairs of the National Youth Administration, where she stayed until 1944. In 1937, Bethune organized a conference on the problems of Negro and Negro youth and fought to end discrimination and lynching. I feel like I'm just reciting so many things, but it's because there's so many achievements that she had. In 1940, she became vice president of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons, which you know today as the NAACP, a position she held for the rest of her life. She was a member, I mean, and she was one of the people that got that esteemed organization started. She was a member of the advisory board in 1942 that created the Women's Army Corps uh, during World War II. Uh, and I've talked about that when I talk about Buckingham Field and made sure it was racially integrated. Mary was appointed by President Harry S. Truman as the only woman of color at the founding conference of the UN in 1945. She also wrote for the leading African-American newspapers, the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender. Mary became involved with clubs and organizations supporting the efforts of African-American women. Starting at the state level, she worked to establish programs that would fight to end segregated education to improve health care for Black children, and to help women use their voting for it to advance equality. Her success at the local level brought her to national prominence when the National Association of Colored Women, NACW, elected her as its eighth national president in 1924. Working with a large national organization, helped Mary develop a network of contacts. Using her previous administrative experiences, she proved to be a good manager of the day-to-day -day activities of the 10,000 member association. I, I think that was an understatement. I think she became a great manager. She increased membership, undertook fundraising and strengthened communication between members. When her tenure as president ended, she began plans for an umbrella organization that would not just focus on making women better people, but on helping them to become facilitators of social change. The results of these plans drove her to create the National Council of Negro Women Incorporated on December 5th, 1935, where she unanimously was elected its first president, serving until 1949. Are you as in awe of her as I am and everything that she accomplished? Not just that, but Bethune was also a businesswoman who co-owned a Daytona, Florida resort and co-founded the Central Life Insurance Company of Tampa. Her achievements were recognized by multiple awards given to her over her lifetime. And before I undertook this, of course, I knew who she was, but I don't think I knew the depth of the things um, and the breadth of things that she accomplished. Mary's close friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt, who you probably recognize is in this picture with her, was instrumental in gaining regular access to the president, President Franklin Roosevelt. In 1936, President Roosevelt asked her to join the National Youth Administration. And by 1939, she became the Director of Negro Affairs. As Director, Bethune was the highest paid African American in government at the time with a $5,000 salary. Under her guidance as Director, NYA employed hundreds of thousands of young African. American men and women 
and established a Negro college and graduate fund that assisted over 4,000 students in higher education. Her work with the Roosevelt administration continued when she established and led the informal black cabinet. And that's in quotes. The term was created by Bethune in 1936 and frequently used to describe President Roosevelt's advisors on issues facing black communities around the country. The black cabinet worked on lynching legislation, attempts to ban poll taxes in the South, wealth and that's me having to pay to vote. Excuse me, I'm gonna. <coughs> Welfare, and they worked with the New Deal agencies to create jobs for unemployed African-Americans. The cabinet also helped draft the presidential executive orders that ended exclusion of African-Americans and armed forces and defense industries during World War II. I remember I told you she helped to establish the Women's Army Corps. The influence of the Black cabinet grew from the unparalleled, excuse me, the influence of the Black cabinet grew from the unparalleled access of Mary McLeod Bethune to the president and first lady. The cabinet's work laid the political foundation for what would become the modern civil rights movement. And I am going to go back because I just skipped over that and this letter, this was from a young woman in 1946 and it's kind of cut off, but I'll read you that it says, my dear Miss Washington, it is glorious to think that you young people are interested in the lives of people of your own race who have endeavored through hard work and study and training to be a blazing, to accomplish something worthwhile. Those of us who have wore a more safe and lasting bridge over which millions that shall come after us may find a safe passage into a more lasting, full and lasting life. I have come, as you know, the hard way. 71 years ago, the doors of opportunity for education and training were not as widely open to us as they are to you and poverty there was very deep an earnest desire in my heart to learn in order that I may be of service to mankind. Excuse me, I'm gonna to have to take a drink. I apologize. My philosophy of education is the basic principle upon which my life has been built. That is the threefold training of head, hand, and heart. I believe in a rounded education with belief in the dignity and refinement of labor in doing well whatever task is assigned to me, a belief in a spiritual undergirthing of all my efforts and a clear, sane mental development. There has always been within me a desire to serve others, not for myself, but for others, has always been one of my mottos. Not to be ministered unto, but to minister was the motto of my graduation class. Enter to learn, depart to serve that was in quotes, has been the slogans I have sent down through the years through the training and service of the students who have found their way to me. Not to hate, but to love has brought great peace and happiness and a feeling of brotherhood that nothing else could give. Thou God seest me, in quotes, has been the guiding protection for my moral strength. I must live within myself in peace and with the understanding that after all, I am my brother's keeper. To Miss Washington, page two. Out of one blood, God has created all the nations of the earth. Another quote. Has given to me my great national and international fellowship with all mankind. No race, no creed, no color upon these basic principles, young people, I have endeavored to build 
a life that I hope may serve as a little torch for you when you approach the darkness and the hours of confusion. I wish you might know my college. I wish that you might see it. I am now 71 years old, yet years to me are but a passing dream. I live a full life of service every day with a sparkle in my eyes, vigor in my step, and love in my heart. I wish for you and your high school class a successful future. Keep climbing. God bless you all. Sincerely yours, Mary McLeod Bethune. And if you go on the Florida Memory Project, you can find other letters she wrote. Um, there's some very moving ones, but this one to a high school student um, espousing her philosophy really touched my heart. But I do hope you'll seek out more information. So that's why I picked that one to share with you. Bethune died in May 1955. A statue of her was erected in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C. In 1985, she was recognized as one of the most influential African-American women in the country with a stamp issued in her honor. And there was something I left off, so I'm going to read to you for a minute. In 1973, Bethune was inducted into the National Woman's Hall of Fame. It would have been on her 19th birthday. Um, 99th birthday that she had that statue memorial dedicated in Lincoln Park. And that was the first memorial to honor an African-American and woman in a public park in the nation's capital. I told you about becoming the second woman, black woman after Harriet Tubman on a US postage stamp as part of its Black Heritage series. Um, when the council house officially opened to the public as a unit of the national park system in 1995, it became the sessional, second national park named for a black woman after the Maggie L. Walker his National Historic Site in Richmond, Virginia. There's a historic marker in Maysville, her hometown, Sumter County, South Carolina, commemorating her birthplace and schools have been named for her all across America. And there's so much more. There's a resume of her. There's a statue of her. There's more than one statue. And also, I wanted to mention that upon her retirement from her role as president from Bethune Cookman College in 1947 and president of uh, numerous organizations, including the NCNW, the National Council of Negro, Negro Women in 1949, Bethune spent the remainder of her life, which was until 1955 at her official home, which she called the retreat. And that's now known as the Mary McLeod Bethune Foundation National Historic Landmark, which is located on the campus of her beloved school. Um, so it's a national historic landmark you can visit. The college is still there. The university is still there today. And there she entertained national leaders, foreign dignitaries. Uh, she inspired countless young men and women to speak on current events and cement her lasting legacy. And that is where she died. And what a story and what a woman. Let's keep going. Mary McLeod Bethune, let's tell you more. The larger than life statue had been on display in Florida, its home state since October, 2021 before making its trip to Washington, DC. It was formally unveiled in a ceremony led by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi at the time and featuring many of the lawmakers and activists who fundraised for years to make the moment happen. And this was started uh, by Governor Rick Scott and approved by Governor Ron DeSantis. It removed another statue and this statue is in Statuary Hall in the Capitol. U.S. Representative, Kath, Representative Kathy Castor, Democrat of Florida, said at the ceremony that Bethune represents all the values, the state, the first to be represented by a Black American National Statuary Hall. Holds dear from industriousness to thirst for education to desire to build peace. On July 
13, 2023, Bethune became the first African American to be represented with a state statue in National Statuary Hall collection at the United States Capitol. And they all can't be in the Statuary Hall. It became overcrowded when there was 30 something, but it is in the Capitol. They're in different places there. So what so it didn't become too heavy with too crowded with too many statues. But it left Florida, where you can see it on display in the Capitol today. Um, and it kind of represents everything that Mary McLeod Bethune accomplished uh, for the state of Florida, for Black students, um, for people of all races to look up to as an example and a tireless worker. Her college remains there as a place you can visit. You, and there is a sculpture of her today. The history of Bethune Cookman College, University, excuse me. The school Bethune founded had many changes. In 1923 and finalized in 1925, the school merged with the Cookman Institute of Jacksonville, which was founded in 1872. The Cookman Institute was the first institution for higher education of Blacks in the state of Florida. It was through the merger that the school gained what was considered a prestigious Methodist affiliation. Um, and this is just a little sample of the campus. I have never been there myself, but I would love to visit and I would like to see what is their home. Um, I don't know if it's open to the public or if you can just visit the outside, but I think that would be very meaningful. 1925, the merger was um, finalized and it was called the Daytona Cookman Collegiate Institute. In 1931, the college became accredited by the Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools of the Southern States as a junior college. And on April 27th of that year, the school's name was officially changed to Bethune Cookman College to reflect the leadership of Dr. Bethune and where she, she was a college graduate, I believe the doctor became from some honorary degrees, which were well deserved. Uh, and then in 1927, 2007, Bethune Cookman became a university. Uh, my goal in talking about her is to make you want to know more information. There's lots of information online, there are books. There's more parts to her story. And one thing I thought about as I was getting ready to go over this today was that I wish I had traced what family members were alive. I would love to meet them. I'd love to more, more stories about this remarkable woman. I'm assuming she has ancestors. She had her son. Um, so I'm, that's something I'm gonna be looking forward to and checking out. Um, and this is a, a final quote from Mary McLeod Bethune. I leave, I leave you love. I leave you hope. I leave you the challenge of developing confidence in one another. I leave you respect for the use of power. I leave you faith. I leave you racial dignity. Mary McLeod Bethune. A woman I hold in the highest of esteem and we all can learn a lot from. Here's just some of the um, resources I used from the Florida Memory Project, Florida Today, um, some information on Bethune-Cookman College about her ancestors that were born enslaved, that she was one of 17 children, what she accomplished with moving to Daytona, becoming a teacher, Breaking Down Barriers, the National Park site, New York site, National World War II Museum, um, biography website. There's so much. Start digging and get more information about her. Let me go ahead here. Uh, I hope that's what your appetite to learn more. Next month, on March 14th at 10.30, I will be speaking about the life and legacy of Helen Keller. She was still alive when I was a young child. I will tell you that. Somebody I greatly admired that I always wanted to meet. Uh, so I hope you'll come. And on that, 
Usually they're on the second Tuesday of the month. This one mistakenly was listed for a Wednesday, probably something goofy that I did. Uh, but usually the second Tuesday, rarely on occasion, it will be on a, the third Tuesday. But always check on our calendar and spread the word. We'd like to get more people to watch these because um, we think it's a great resource, not because I'm doing it, but because it's a resource to have people know more about what goes on here at Edison Ford Winter Estates. And not only is I, am I speaking about Helen Keller, but about her friendship with Thomas Edison. Also, once a month for the next few months, you'll see Edison in a parade the last year of his life. The historians, that's the department, one of the uh, departments that is part of the department that Ryan and I oversee. They will be doing a presentation each month on the first Tuesday. This digital discussion is called Thomas and Mina Edison's Impact on Fort Myers History. I've heard it, it's great. Tim Snyder, the historian will be doing it. That'll be March 1st. 2023 at 10.30, so we'll have two presentations. It's called Step Into History Digital Edition. And if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, please, please email me at hshafer at edisonford.org. I hope you'll join me next month. Does anybody have any questions before I sign off? Um, if not, or any comments? I thank you so much for joining me. Um, I am so thankful that you tune in. And remember, these are going to go on YouTube. You'll get a notification. Tell other people. And I hope you'll come visit us at Edison Ford Winter Estates. And if you're not, consider becoming a member because there's so many benefits. It's so affordable. And there's reciprocals and many other things. Uh, wait, let's see. We got a chat up here. Thanks so much, Holly. Great info. Thank you, Maxine. I thank you all. Uh, thank you, Judy. I appreciate you. And I hope you'll join me uh, to learn about one of my other Shiro's in addition to learn, um, sharing about Mary McLeod Bethune that we'll be talking about Helen Keller. Thank you. And I'll see you next month on the second Tuesday of the month at 1030. And don't forget to tune in for the Step Into History Digital Edition, Thomas Amina's Impact in Fort Myers History. I'll see you then. Thank you. Bye-bye.